pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement. Welcome to a Wednesday Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or to the bouncer down at the Sizzler happy hour who never lets me in, the Fintern. It's the 4th of July here in the basement, and everyone else walked down to the park, but I'm excited that I'm here with you, and working more than one day per week. I can't wait to tell my mom that I have a stable job for now. You know, nothing says stability like working on a holiday while everyone else is out playing. But they say the people who work while everyone else is playing are the real winners. So, in the interest of world domination, this Rewind episode is all about building your real estate empire. Ever wonder how the whole real estate game works? Brandon Turner from the Bigger Pockets podcast joins the guys for this one. And I think you'll like learning about developing a respectable earning off of rental properties. Needless to say, take all advice lightly and don't enter into any competitions or giveaways because they're long over. It's time to look back into what the basement was like in 2016. Enjoy! Fin turn out. Hey, this is Pete the Planner, USA Today money columnist and host of the Ask Pete the Planner podcast. When I'm not fixing the weirdest financial situations you've ever heard of, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I want to take this opportunity to advertise my room for rent over at my house. It's a small but cozy room, just enough room for a twin bed or eh, maybe better yet, a cot. Imagine really a small utility closet, about that size. To all you hipsters out there into this whole tiny house movement thing, it would be massive and luxurious. You'd love it. Speaking of rooms for rent, join Joe and OG today with our guest, Brandon Turner from real estate site Bigger Pockets. The dumbest article on the internet last week, and the five deadly sins of money management. Now, here are two guys who filed rental applications with me last week. Hey, Joe, you finally moving out of the basement? It's Joe and O J J J J G. Did you know that was Doug that we were filing that application with? <laughs> no, I was not told. Yeah, we got to back away from that in a hurry. Hey, everybody, welcome to Wednesday on the Stack of Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Just so you know, which voice is which. And across the card table from me, my partner in crime, the other guy, or as we call him, OG. What is up? Well, apparently today, real estate is up. We got the real estate bug in the air with Brandon Turner coming down. I've got, I've got a real estate bug. I do. I mean, you and I talked about this, haven't we? Yeah. 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 You're itching to buy some real estate. Yes. It is that time. Well, and you also have the itch to remodel some real estate. I would have to. The kind of real estate I can afford. (laughs) Turn that utility closet into the dream home that you really want. Oh, we got that. We got a bunch more. But today, you know what you've got? You've got this wonderful opportunity to start 2016 on the right foot by heading to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Nick Clements was on the show on Monday. And those of you that heard that show know how awesome he is. Well, he takes that awesomeness and he sprinkles it all over his site, Magnify Money, where you can compare all the top checking accounts, savings accounts, and debt products on the internet. Things ranging from credit cards to consolidation loans. He's got you covered well more than 90% of the things out there. And you know what? What's the sense of trying to have an epic 2016 if you don't have epic financial tools? Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money to get that done. And if you have a great credit score and you're looking to consolidate debt or to get out of debt more quickly, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, S-O-F-I, the lowest interest rate you'll find on debt products anywhere. And if you use our link, that stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi link, guess what? They will throw in $100 that you can use. We can use it however you want, but we recommend taking that and using it to pay down the loan. Whether it's student loans, personal loans, or mortgages, use that money to pay them down. Or, OG, you've got a better idea. I recommend that you send 75 of the 100 to us. Right. It's just a thank you love letter for introducing you to such an awesome company. Absolutely. It was found money anyway, so you should be happy with $25. (laughs) You'll take your 25 and you'll like it. Something you're going to like, Brandon Turner, who's upstairs talking to mom right now. So let's get him down here. But before that, we got some headlines. Hello, darlings. 
And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Oh, just when we thought that it couldn't get dumber, oh gee, just when we thought it couldn't get dumber. I thought that was kind of a cool study that Fidelity did about resolutions. Courts, who by the way, held the record for the dumbest thing we'd read on the internet before, comes to us with something even dumber. This is an article that says, forget resolutions, use these nerdy life hacks to make life a little bit better in a lot of ways. I thought this was awesome. Came up on my flipboard. I thought, oh, I'm kind of a nerd. I like life. This fits your style. It does. I like a life hacker. (laughs) Absolutely. The article says it is New Year's. This article written by, unfortunately, by William McCaskill. It's New Year's. You want to set goals and achieve them, but realistically, you're probably not going to. Researchers find anywhere from 40% to 8 Listen to this. Anywhere from 40% to 8% of Americans who set New Year's resolutions successfully stick to them. 40 to 80%? Is that what you just said? No. 40% to 8 And that's when my head kind of went, huh? Researchers find anywhere from 40% to 8% of Americans who set New Year's resolutions successfully stick to them. This is the state of journalism today. The problem is people often aim to completely overhaul their lives, setting themselves lofty and unachievable goals. I'm going to get up at dawn every day, then go to the gym, meditate, and eat five portions of fruits and vegetables all before work. Once one part of this magnificent edifice of intentions gets chipped away, you hit the snooze button, for instance, it all comes crashing down. Oh, man. So instead, this rocket scientist says that we should do some of these tweaks. Here is... How do you think you should save time at restaurant? By the way, have you ever gone to a restaurant, OG, and thought, you know what? If we could hurry this situation up. I mean, I understand the waiter being slow, right? But generally, if you're going out to a restaurant, you're having a meal for fun, you're out on the town. How often do you think, you know, I wish this went quicker, especially if I'm out with a group of friends, right? I'm out with a group of friends. I'm like, get me out of this group of friends. (laughs) That's how I feel a lot. Or maybe that's how people feel about me. I don't know. (laughs) You beat me to your own punchline there. So suppose you're at a restaurant for dinner with six friends. That bill, including tip, comes to $140. This is the author speaking. You want to split it equally. You guys went to a pretty crappy place. This means, right. This means everybody should play 2333. Everyone has to interrupt the conversation to wrangle the approximate change while stepping lightly around the etiquette of who might be overpaying or underpaying. It's potentially uncomfortable and a waste of time. Think of one time you went to a restaurant where this was a huge Incredible problem. Like I'm reading this. I'm like, really? This is a life hack? Oh, but there's a better solution. Guess what the solution is that just speeds us up and makes this problem go away? I can't even imagine a solution easier than the bill comes and everybody throws their credit card on the plate. And (laughs) And say, please divide this evenly. Yeah. No, 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 no. You can't do that, dude. No, 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 no. The solution, randomly pick one person to pay the whole bill. Deal. That could really backfire. You're like, I'll take a uh, <laughs> gallon of Dom Perignon. I'm going to do the Neptune platter. Uh, oh, crap. That was me. I've heard a variation of this story we should talk about in another place. Oh, dude, it gets better. Oh, just remind me about the variation of that particular. Oh, yeah. So that's a financial solution is, but the cool thing is it's like betting, right? Like if you're out with six friends, one out of every six times, you're going to get screwed with the bill. If you're a lucky person, you might never have to pay. I love it. How awesome is that? That's a financial plan. How we to make do that next time you and I go out to dinner. Number two on this list, how to make bad events less bad. Like something bad happens to you. You know how to make it less bad. Let's life hack making bad events less bad. The problem, bad events like failing an exam or having a potential spouse reject your marriage proposal make your life seem worse. What do you think the solution to that would be? I don't know. It's a financial solution. Bet Costa Rica. Oh, even better. Bet against yourself. Here's how this works. If you think there's a 40% chance you failed an important exam, then find someone who'll take the following bet. You'll pay them $80 if you pass, and they'll pay you $120 if you fail. In general, if you think something bad might happen, make a bet that it will happen. Why it works? In effect, betting against yourself is a way of taking out an emotional insurance policy. (laughs) If you get good news, then you'll be so happy you won't mind parting with your money. If you get bad news, then at least you've gotten a little bit of cash. Which makes up for everything. Well, in 120, for that, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Bye yeah. Bye zero. Okay. Number three, how to stay we alert. We have to go through the rest of these. Oh, yeah. Staying alert during the day. How to do that. Not coffee. Uh, no, you get um, 
play. Hold on, it's about money. So let's do. You should play poker online with your four hundred one k, and that just keeps your adrenaline up, right? Yeah, exactly. No, it says to stock your office with one of those seasonal affective disorder lamp options that are out there. I just moved across the country. It was easier. This is actually funny, OG, why it works. It says there's only anecdotal evidence behind this one, but it's easy to try out. So there's little cost to giving it a go and seeing if it works for you. We why have, it works? Well, we don't think it does, actually. We have no proof, but go ahead and try it. Use this affiliate link right here <laughs> to buy lamp. Oh, uh, how to get out of bed, how to eat more healthy foods, Ooh, how, um, how to get smarter. You know how to get smarter? Don't read this article don't, that we'll link to on our show notes from Quartz. Don't, don't be stupid. Somewhere between 4% so and 8% of people stupid. keep their goals. Oh. So this is basically exactly what they wanted to happen. Uh, yeah. Just, just getting a lot of airplay. Beating my Not head against the... Uh, much better though. You know what? You can always rely on Chuck Jaffe for an awesome article. Chuck Jaffe writes at Market Watch. This is his opinion piece is Chuck Jaffe's articles always are. Let's do a cleanse here, OG, by getting some good stuff. Five deadly investing sins that let cons and crooks take your money. Luckily, I also read this one initially on my Flipboard. And what's cool about this is that they were like one after another. I read something that's incredibly dumb, followed by something as good as this. So the five deadly investing sins. Number one is greed. Chuck says, most people don't consider it greedy to want better returns, but there's a fine line between stretching for a better return and crossing the line blindly, thinking you can dominate the market, strike it rich, or hit the jackpot. The NASAA warning about Ponzi schemes and its alert over gas and oil investments and promissory notes is a direct response to greed. We talked about this a few weeks ago on the show about lots of oil and gas partnerships, supposedly that are just big time, big time Ponzi schemes, people losing lots of money. If it seems too good to be true, OG, it probably is. And we heard that before. I had a friend on a run the other day. We were out running and he told me this. I've never heard of this before. Tell me if this exists. He said that he's going to invest with this dude. Who, Especially if he said it that way, that totally makes it legitimate so far. Yeah, he didn't say that. He's going to invest with this guy who has a 4% fee. But the 4% is only 4% of what he makes, not 4% of the money that's out there. Now, I know a lot of people charge based on the amount of money that you have. Uh And I know there's some hedge funds that keep money based on what you achieve. But have you ever heard of 4% of advisors just charging 4% of what they make you? Well, no, I haven't. And the reason for that is because I guess you can put whatever you want in your ADV form, right? I mean... You can ask for whatever fee you want to ask for. And just to be clear here, your ADV is your disclosure document. The disclosure document that you have to submit when you're registering to be a financial advisor, investment advisor. You can look anybody up. That would be the first place I would look because that's a performance fee. Those are kind of tricky because you got to have some pretty sophisticated accounting software in there to be able to track, especially if you're somebody that's if you're advising a client who has monthly contributions going in, right, right. you know, you got to track the dollar weighted return of each one of those contributions, you know, and that was just a red flag for me. You know oh, what I mean? Gigantic, I mean, the most sophisticated hedge funds in the world. Don't do it that way. Charge two and 20, right? 2% of the assets, 20% of the profits. Yeah. But that comes out of like the big pot before anything. Right. The other thing you can think about with performance fees is, is there a high watermark? Sometimes the problem with performance fees is that it causes people to swing for the fences on everything, you know? So you have a really great year and then you have a really bad year and then a medium year the next year. Well, so do you get charged on the rebound that hasn't even got you back to where you were yet? Or does it have to hit that high watermark again before any fees are calculated from that point? Right. Yeah, good point. You know, so I put 100000 in and it grows to 200000 and I pay you. And then it drops to one twenty five. Do I, I not pay you again until I get above 200000 Yeah. And then my 125 goes to one seventy five. You know, it's a good return, but I'm still not back to where I was. Yeah. Do I have to pay, Yeah, you know, pretty slippery uh, performance fees? Yeah. And I started asking the guy. I mean, clearly he didn't want to talk about it much. So I c- Clearly he wanted to. He just wanted your approval because he brought it up. And then when you went, eh, he was like, ah, I've, you know, I've already checked it out. It's good. Yeah. 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 It's great. What's funny about that is that this individual was moving the money from Charles Schwab because they kept charging him account fees. And well, uh, obviously. just this would be a lot cheaper. <laughs> 
that was, yeah, the whole thing. Number two is fear. The yin to greed's yang, the other side of the coin, but every bit as dangerous. Fear is an emotion played upon by those unlicensed salesmen hawking unregistered securities. It's also used to pitch a lot of mainstream products such as equity indexed annuities and other twists that are supposed to insulate the investor from losses. We see these all the time, man. I heard about them. There was a thing the other day on XM radio as I'm driving down the street telling me about, hey, you could lose tons and tons of money in the market, just tons of money. And that's why, especially if you're close to retirement, you need to know how to time the market better. You gotta have it protected. Yep. <laughs> yeah. For yourselves, man. Yeah. Very scary. Number three is sloth. Call it convenience if you're an optimist or laziness, if you're a pessimistic judge of human nature. But investors could save themselves from a lot of trouble if they simply did the basics and due diligence. How many times did somebody walk into your office, had it happen with me a lot, man, when I was an advisor, and the person, they said, yep, you're the first person we ever met with. Nope, it wasn't a referral, like found me in the phone book, and then said, they have phone books anymore? And then said, yeah, your story sounds good. We'll hire you. Got to do some research. I mean, it's your life savings, right? It's your retirement. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash broker check is a great place to start. By the way, that's just our link for our listeners. It sends you right to the FINRA website where you can check out any person who's a financial advisor and see what their record looks like. Shows all the blemishes on their record. And that's a great place to ask questions. Number four is assumptions, right? When you assume, remember that one? I like people that assume. When ripoffs and scams are exposed and uncovered by regulators, it's not uncommon to find out that the crime affected entire families, church communities, and other affinity groups. And the reason is, is because people assume that if, quote, this works for my father slash family member slash friend slash minister slash barber, it's good enough for me. Man, you see that all the time, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what my buddy out on the run thought was, hey, this 4% deal, this is a great deal. Telling me about it, right? I can't even see how that math works out for the advisor. No, I don't get it in this case. But when Rick Ferry was on around Halloween talking about investments, talking about how this scammer took the entire church by storm, took all the people in this single church by storm, which leads to number five, which is blind trust. I think we know where that's headed. We'll link to these much, much better writing there. OG by Chuck Jaffe. A little Jaffe. bit better. Yeah. yeah. Chuck Jaffe, not his first rodeo, right? We'll link to those on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Real estate. Do you like these real estate shows that are on like the Property Brothers or Flip or Flop? I have an opinion about them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but do you like them? I don't like the Property Brothers. You don't? No, I don't like the Property Brothers one. It's just not my, not my style. Not your deal, but people think flipping houses is just the... Cakewalk, man. You go in there. I don't know, changes, man. You, you make like a hundred grand. It's all on TV. You can't watch Christina and Tariq and think this is easy because they end up with some junk every episode, right? These huge they problems. make money. And then 30, they have 000, these... 40,000, 72,000. You know, it's funny. They... Barrel. They had an episode that I was watching actually last night where it took them five months and they made, I think, $55,000. And you do that math and then you look at all the time that they put into it, right? All the stuff. And you think... Here's my question about that, though. I watched this show this weekend about this. Do you think, number one, that they're only doing one at a time? They're not. Oh, no. Right? So they, they got multiple irons in the fire. Right, right. So I look at it and I go, eh, you know, it took them three months to make 30 grand. Okay, $10,000 a month on average. You know, that's a reasonable return on investment there. Reasonable return on time, I guess, better way to put it. But then I was thinking like, first of all, that's not earth shattering money. But then I remembered they're probably not showing every deal that they do. Right. And they're probably doing multiple deals at the same time. Otherwise, they wouldn't be famous enough to be on TV. Right. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, good stuff. I I don't think they're hurting. Well, a guy who doesn't flip properties, he is a buy and hold guru. Brandon Turner has written many books now about investing in real estate. Two of his new books, the book on rental property investing, how to create wealth and passive income through smart buy and hold real estate investing. And a book he wrote with his spouse, the book on managing rental properties. Brandon Turner, also the co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast podcast we just absolutely love and a 
company that we really enjoy. Uh, He's not a big fan of buying inexpensive properties. Well, let's ask him. He's a fan of you get what you pay for, but Brandon Turner coming down to the basement. Turner from Bigger Pockets joins us in the basement. Dude, welcome back. Hey, thank you. You know, I hit my head on the way down the stairs again like I do every time. Isn't that you? really got to fix that. How tall are you? Six foot five and a half. <laughs> you can't forget the half. You can't forget the half. Some people round up, but I just add the half. Just so you can look down on all those six five losers. Exactly. <laughs> you know, six five is like normal. I always like to say six five is normal. Six five and a half is okay. And then six six gets like awkward tall. Yeah. So I'm like on the border of awkward tall and handsome tall. So... I'm like hackward tall, and I'm okay with that. Hackward. That's our new word for the Wednesday <laughs> edition of Stacking Benjamins. Hey, I want to ask you this. So you and I are talking at FinCon, and you're like, hey, I got this great thing. And I think this was a story. So one of my rental houses is like on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my rental houses caught fire this year. And by caught fire, I mean the tenant lit it on fire. Whether it was on purpose, on accident, we don't know. We'll never know. But yeah, I decided uh, he was moving out. He's being evicted. He was a bad tenant. and. Wait a minute, a bad tenant who burns down the house? I know. <laughs> Shock. Don't you all want to get into real estate? Man, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, where were we? Charlotte? And I get a phone call from the tenant who says, yeah, he's moving out. And he tells me the house is on fire. I'm like, oh man, you know, that's terrible. You know, trying to deal with it. And then I realized like he says, well, the fire department says a box was set on top of the stove and then the stove was turned on and all his stuff was out, all his good stuff, all his garbage was left. And then somehow a box gets set on the stove, turned on, and then leaves. Luckily, it didn't burn all the way down, but I have insurance, and everything's going to be made all right. And we're still working on putting it all back together. But yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe he set a box, and it accidentally bumped the stove thing, and it turned on, and he left. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, but know. even with that going on, you still like real estate investing. I love real estate. I mean, if anything, it solidifies why I love it. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this is pretty much worst case scenario. I mean, yeah, somebody came to my house and murder me, I suppose. But like in realistic, like what could happen with real estate, people consider like a fire burning down your house or a flood is like the two worst things that can happen. And I hit both those this year. I had a flood that completely destroyed my town. Like a lot of houses were ruined, including oh. some of mine. Not ruined, but you know, new yeah, carpets. Right. And we had a fire. And uh, at the end of the day, I still made money in real estate. Insurance took care of all of the expensive stuff. And uh, I'm going to have better houses at the end of the day than I had when I started for no money because there's a lot of those safeguards in place. That's what I was going to ask you about was that, is there some precaution that you took as a seasoned real estate investor that a newbie might've gotten caught in a trap there? I mean, maybe the idea of not having insurance when people buy stuff for cash. I mean, people sometimes won't get insurance because they're like, oh, I bought it for cash. No, I don't buy it for cash. I have bank loans and the banks require you to have insurance. So they kind of, in a way, when you invest, you know, the banks kind of keep you honest. Like they keep you from screwing up too bad because they've got an interest. Because their money's on the line. Yeah, their money's on the line. Yeah. So they keep you okay. I mean, there's some things with insurance that I'm sure we're not going to go into because I would put everyone to sleep. But, you know, there's things I learned about insurance that you should and should not have. And I mean, the important thing is talk to your insurance person and say, look, what would actually happen if my house burned down? Somebody told me, and I think it might have been Phil Town, who said you really can learn a lot from banks because banks don't make a lot of money on every deal, but they make money on every deal, right? Yes. They're very conservative and they're very, you know, like there's been a number of times where I've been turned down from a bank or a lender, you know, like maybe like a hard money lender, we'll call them. Like they're people who do it for a business. They lend on real estate. And so I've been turned down and then I go and try to buy the property anyway. And I find a way to make it happen. And then later I'm like, dang it, they were right. Like they know the game more than I know the game. And so I should have just listened to them. When the bank says no, it doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it, but there's a good reason why maybe it's more risky, I guess. And banks don't want risk. Yeah. Those actuaries, I don't know if they make more money because they do a great job or because it's the world's most boring job. Yeah. <laughs> just, I don't know. Is. What taught you initially to love real estate? How I mean, did that love affair begin? Was it like slow dance into a Barry White song with a piece of property or what was going on there? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of slow dancing involved there. So I started, I fell in love with it because I bought a house and I fixed it up. And while I was fixing it, I was renting out all the rooms to a couple of buddies of mine, my brother-in-law and a couple other, well, at the time it was my girlfriend's brother and a bunch of friends from work. But did you, not to stop you, Brandon, but did you do that on purpose or was it like somebody like me who was an accidental landlord when I found out I couldn't sell my damn house? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had no interest in like, you know, trying to build wealth through real estate. I just said, you know, a lady told me, she said, Hey, it's cheaper for you to buy a house than rent. And I'm like, Okay. So I went and bought a house. And, you know, this is back in 2007 when they're like 
throwing mortgages at people like it's candy at a parade. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like 21 year old kid with no income, no credit, no minimum wage job. And Perfect. Like, Here, take a, yeah, take a mortgage, take two, you know, like they don't care. <laughs> so I got this house and it was cheaper than renting. And then I rented out all the bedrooms and I was living for free. And I was like, this is pretty sweet. And then I sold the property and I made 20 grand. And my wife and I used that money for like kind of our dream wedding. And we're like, that was really cool. It was great. We should do it again. And we just started buying properties and flipped a few of them. And we held some as rentals. We even bought a duplex, lived in a half of it, rented half out and lived for free for a while. My in-laws uh, did that. That's the way he fell in love with real estate was the duplex. Yep. Yep. I call that house hacking. Like I'm trying to make that phrase known across the world. So, you know, listeners start using that phrase. And I said it first, house hacking. It's like this concept of you're using your own primary home as an investment property. So you're kind of hacking your housing, live for free. So you can even get paid to live for free if you get a really good deal. One property we found out after we bought it, it was our very first duplex, our house hack. We lived in the property for a while and people kept taking pictures of the front of the house or flashes, you know, in the windows. And the tenants that lived in the front by the road kept complaining about it. Every couple of weeks, it'd be a flash, flash, and then cars would drive away. We were like, well, maybe the county is assessing the property or maybe something going on. And then one day, this is like three years later, they get a knock, the tenants, they're going to knock the door from some Swedish tourists and they wanted a tour of the Kurt Cobain house. And we found out that Kurt Cobain in Nirvana, that was his baby house, the very first house he ever lived in when he was a little baby. Did that house smell like teen spirit? It did smell like teen spirit. Yeah. Especially when we bought it, man, that thing was rough. But it's funny that nobody knew that this was a, like, I don't want to call it historic house, but you know, it was a you know house that people care about. I'm sure it sold for more. So, you know, that's my own little, it doesn't give me any higher rent today. I mean, it's, it's in kind of a little crappy house in a crappy area, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's kind of Kurt Cobain, I guess. In your book, you reference four wealth generators and just looking at the headlines. So I can come up with two wealth generators that reliably over time beat inflation, but what are the four? So the four that talk about in rental properties, especially, and, and any real estate can take some of these, but rental properties capitalize on all four. And that is appreciation, which is prices going up in value over time. You buy a house for 90, you sell it 10 years later for 190. And everyone thinks that they're a genius because they got appreciation. Number one, leverage. Number two would be cash flow. That's my favorite thing. I love the money that comes every month from real estate, right? So your income is $1,000 a month and all of your expenses combined is 800. You make 200 bucks a month. I mean, how many properties do you need to own if you're making $200 each to be able to have financial freedom, to have that security? I don't need my job. I can quit, whatever. All right. What's the third one? All right. Third one, I'm going to call it the loan pay down. Other people call it the amortization or whatever. I like loan pay down because it basically means that if you have a mortgage on the property, every month it gets paid down a little less. So I have a $100,000 mortgage and let's just say I made no cash flow whatsoever. I broke even every month and an appreciation didn't do a thing. I bought it at a hundred. It's worth a hundred 10 years from now. So the other two wealth generators, let's say they're gone. If nothing else, over those 10 years, my mortgage is going to be paid down to let's say 80,000 and I didn't pay it down. My tenants paid it down. And so I'm automatically generating wealth just by owning the property and the loan being paid down. So now it's worth, you know, still worth a hundred, we'll say. And, you know, I only owe 80 on it. I just made 20 grand off doing nothing but managing the property correctly. So the process of deleveraging is building wealth, right? Yes. I mean, on that particular property, but then you're leveraging on the next property. Yep. Yep. Very, very true. Yeah. Okay. And then the fourth one? Fourth one would be the tax benefits. Oh, yeah. One thing that I found that you know, if you take two people and you take Bob over here and Bob makes $60,000 a year from his W-2 job, he works as a salesman or whatever. And he makes, let's say three people. We got Bob and he's making 60,000 a year off his W-2 job. And we've got Sally who makes $60,000 a year off her business. She owns, she owns her own hair salon. And then you've got this guy, Larry, who owns real estate is making 60,000 a year in cash flow. That's not the same 60,000 a year because of taxes. And you know, the, the guy making the W-2 job is losing a huge portion of it. The person in the middle, I don't know, was it Sally? She's losing a small portion of it to self-employment tax and all that. But real estate, the 60000 in cash flow, there's very, very little taxes paid. In fact, when I was living on my cash flow for a while and didn't have a job, I paid, I mean, really no taxes. I was making more than most of my friends and I paid far less taxes than everybody. And so you can incorporate that. There's a lot of other tax benefits with real estate as well, besides just the lower tax, but it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's just the no self-employment tax saves you 15% right there. Right. It's not about what you make. It's what you keep. What you keep. Yeah. So 60,000 is more like the equivalent of a hundred thousand from somebody else earning it at a job. And that's kind of the fourth. Now, the beautiful part about rental properties is it combines all four of these into one. And so you get a property with a loan, you're paying it down every month. Property values are going up. Even if it's only 3%, it's still going up a little bit. And you know, you get the cash flow every month and you can recycle that. And then you get the tax benefits while you're owning it. And so combining all four of those together, it can make a pretty awesome investment. Yeah, but Brandon, you take that, all that awesomeness, 
all together. And somebody goes, okay, this sounds really cool. And then they go, I don't want to fix toilets at two o'clock yep. in the morning. Right. It's yeah. just not what I want to do. I mean, I remember this. I had a client when I was a financial advisor who was fantastic at real estate. He had a duplex where he had a tenant upstairs, tenant downstairs, tenant upstairs, hated the tenant downstairs. So when they moved out, didn't care about Wayne, my client. They just cared that they were going to piss off the people downstairs. They turned on all the water just before they moved out and left. And the tenant downstairs calls up and says, there's water coming in through my roof. And that's when Wayne got out. Wayne said, you know what? I've had enough. So what do you yep. say to those people? Sure. I encourage them to get out of the game and get me their properties. <laughs> I'll manage them correctly. <laughs> But, but what does that mean? Manage, no, I mean, so manage them correctly. Right. Real estate is difficult sometimes. I mean, we started out this show talking about my house burning down. We had a flood last year. I mean, when that flood hit, I went and bought boots and they were like four foot waders, you know, for like that guys go out and like fish with or whatever. So I got these gigantic rubber boots and I went and waded through three and a half feet of water that was, you know, probably sewer water and everything else. And I went and walked over to all my rental properties to make sure they're okay. I even like rescued some guy that was stuck on his bed. He was afraid that the stuck electricity was going to him. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, right. There's water oh, all over the floor yeah. and there's baseboard heaters and he was freaked out. So I went and had to shut his power off. And, you know, like, granted, not everyone has to do that. In fact, most real estate investors I know make fun of me because I do that stuff. The best real estate investors I know, they've got systems in place. They've got people to handle it. They've got management companies that deal with it all. And they deal with that side of things. Now, again, real estate has two components. I mean, very, very different. There's the business of acquisition and, and the big picture stuff. And then there's the management. And you cannot do one without the other. Now, granted, you don't have to be the manager, but you have to manage the process, even if you hire someone else to do it. And so, you know, that's why I'm really big. And that's why I wrote two books or, you know, my wife and I wrote a book and then I wrote one alone. But one of them is the book on managing. One's the book on rental property investing, because you have to have both those right in order to successfully succeed at real estate. Now, that said, I don't fix toilets at two in the morning. I've had one in my entire career. I had one call at two in the morning and it was a lady who said her sink was overflowing or water was going everywhere. So I walked over there at two in the morning. This is my first year in my very first property. I walked over there and I walked over and I just shut off her water because it just became unhooked under the sink. I shut it off. I walked out the door without saying anything. I went back home. And then I showed up the next morning at seven in the morning to fix it. That was the only time I've ever dealt with a middle of the night phone call. So everyone talks about that stuff happening. It doesn't happen that often. And if you're aware of that, it could happen and you have people in place or you have systems in place to handle it. It's not too bad. And at the end of the day, if I have to get up once a decade at two in the morning to go fix some problem... I quit my job at 27 and had enough cash flow to survive right. off, you know, right. with nothing. So I'll do a little hustle in exchange for the benefits. You mean you look at the bigger picture? That's crazy. Yeah, I know. Weird, huh? I mean, and I get it. Real estate's not necessarily for everyone. Sure. I wouldn't be the first that says that. There's a million ways to make money in this world, right? I mean, money is everywhere all the time. It appeals to me quite a bit. It makes sense in my head. I mean, I don't invest in the stock market at all. And a lot of times would think I'm crazy. I don't have mutual funds. I have nothing right now but real estate. And because it makes perfect sense to me and I'm really good at it. And so that's what I focus on. In stock market investing, people diversify and then they've got these accounts all over the place, right? I see these people, they've got just accounts all over. With real estate investing, I mean, you guys on the Bigger Pockets podcast, you talk to people who own 200 properties, maybe more. And I hear this stuff and I think, how do you keep this dashboard in front of you to manage? If I've got 200 properties and my tenant bill calls up or even the manager calls up and he's trying to describe to me which property, <laughs> like, oh, that one, like I barely know what that is. How do you keep the dashboard in front of you of what you're doing? It's a good question. So, I mean, a lot of guys, when they get larger, they've got really good property management software or, or property just, you know, software that's handling it. Things like Appfolio or Buildium, they're kind of the big ones today, Cozy. They're companies that help you manage that. Personally, like I have 45 units right now and it's enough that like, I can keep it all in my head somewhat, but we have a lot of spreadsheets. We have a few like programs that we just used and we built and we use Google Drive and Google Docs a lot, those kind of things. That said, I have a reoccurring nightmare all the time. This is totally true. It happens at least once a month, this reoccurring nightmare. And it's that I bought a property and forgot about it years ago. <laughs> like, it happens all the time. It's like, I wake up just like, how did I forget about that property? I mean, it was such a cool property. It was a castle with a moat around it and there was a unicorn on wait a second. <laughs> I don't have that property. What am I talking about? So like sometimes I'm disappointed in the morning when I wake up. I know because like, oh, wouldn't man. that be an awesome property? Yeah, that would be an awesome property. I wish I had that. It's seriously at least once a month. That tells me that like, you know, my subconscious is thinking I need to be more organized in tracking my units because someday I will forget completely that I own something. And then I'll be like, oh yeah, I probably should take care of that. But it kind of works the way it is right now. 
Oh, man. So the books are the book on rental property investing, book on managing rental properties, book on managing rental properties is you and your wife. And then the book on rental property investing is you. It is. Yeah. We wrote those together. It was kind of a fun experience. Did she just get tired of it and said, Brandon, you write the next one? <laughs> it was more like I was going to write the first book. So I started writing it. I got to the chapter I'm managing. And I'm like, this is going to be a lot longer than one chapter. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to write a whole nother book by myself. I mean, this book's 120,000 words as it is, yeah. which is That's a twice, big old as long as a, yeah, it's twice as long as a normal business book. Right. And I'm like, this is going to be really big. So I was like, hey, want to help me out and write the other book? And so then we kind of co-wrote that one. She probably wrote 60% of the managing one. She manages our properties anyway, more than I do. I buy stuff and I throw it at her and I'm like, here, take care of it. And then she manages. So, so she's kind of worked out. So she's the brains. You're just the good look. I'm, yes, I'm the good looking guy, you know, that just goes out and, <laughs> I don't know, raises money and buys stuff. And says, here. <laughs> and obviously we can get the books at biggerpockets.com. We could get them elsewhere. Yep. Yeah, at Amazon as well. Great. So besides listening to Bigger Pockets, reading Brandon Turner's best selling books, if you're gonna give somebody the first step in getting involved in real estate investing, what's the first thing they should do? Mm, good question. So I would say, you no, know, normally what I tell people is you've got to commit first because like so many people were like they want to do things, right? They want to lose weight, they wanna, you know, save 10 grand, they want to invest in real estate, but then nobody ever does it because everyone just wants it, right? So the easy step or the not easy, but the obvious first step is commit. But secondly, I think you just gotta educate yourself on reading as much as humanly possible. You know, listening to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, read books, go to your library. When I started, that's what I did. I went to my library and got every book they had on real estate. And I just read them all. And you, you just learn so much because real estate is so huge. Like I said earlier, there's like hundreds of ways to make money in real estate and Airbnb is just one of them and rental properties are just one of them and flipping is one of them. And there's so many ways that I don't know what's right for you. I mean, you might be really good at one thing and I have no idea. So the more you educate yourself, the more you kind of learn what you want to get into and then start focusing on that. I guess it's the same thing with any personal finance, right? Like there's so many ways to, there's stocks and bonds and mutual funds and everything else in the world. How do I pick, I don't know, learn about a bunch of them a little bit and then start to focus in on what you think kind of appeals to you with your goals, with your current status in life and we'll go from there. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug here. And after listening to Brandon talk about real estate, it's pretty clear that I'm making a great move by renting out my utility. I mean, this incredibly luxurious spare bedroom I have. Real estate investments rock especially since stocks had a down year in 2015. And that leads me to this week's trivia question. If you're looking to diversify your portfolio, you've probably looked into real estate. Well, what was the overall rate of return on the North American Real Estate Investment Trust Composite Index in 2015? We'll be back with the answer right after this. OG and I are excited to have two sponsors at Stacking Benjamins that we can send people to who will help any of our listeners get their financial house in order. First of all, let's solve your debt problems by sending you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. We talked to Dan Macklin about SoFi because they started in student loans, but then quickly moved on from there. We wondered exactly why they started with student loans. Student loans just seem to be a bigger issue for people. There's over a trillion dollars of student loan debt out there. And it was it really is and, and continues to be a pretty inefficient market. Lots of people overpaying. But we've quickly moved on from that. So as well as student loans, we're now doing other things, including mortgages and personal loans. But student loans was just a, a great entry point because so many people were overpaying. So if you're someone who's overpaying for student loans or for other types of debt, whether it be mortgage or personal loans, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. And once you've been there, we'll send you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Because the thing about Magnify Money that I find really cool is that they do not ask for any personal information before showing you how different financial products rank against each other. And part of that rating system is just how little fine print there is. So we asked Nick Clement, CEO at Magnify Money, to explain more about their rating system and helping you avoid fine print. Oh, the fine print can get out of control. You'll always see marketing, which tells you this is free or we're even going to put money in your pocket if you do business with us. But then when you look underneath the hood, you can find fees on top of fees on top of fees. And some, some of the worst are in the world of overdrafts where you can be charged $35 per item 
And then after five days of a negative balance charge, another $35, particularly in that area, you see banks that are worse than payday lenders, although they're not advertised that way. So for checking accounts, savings accounts, and debt products that you understand, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Hey everyone, Joe's mom's neighbor Doug back with the answer to this week's trivia question. We all know it was a bit of a bumpy ride for the stock market last year, but was it also bumpy for real estate? What was the rate of return on the North American Real Estate Investment Trust Index? Well, it turns out it hit a bit of a rough patch, too, losing 3.5% of its value last year. That must mean that real estate prices are lower. I'd better go check with Joe's mom to see if she wants to move the vacuum and brooms out of her uh, luxurious spare bedroom and rent that out, too. Maybe we can get a little real estate empire thing going here. Thanks to Brandon Turner for coming down to the basement. It's amazing. I'm talking to him at FinCon and one of his rental properties on fire. Not a good day. Like literally on fire. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Not on fire in our neighborhood last weekend too. But I love how his experience brought him through that, you know, about how, hey, not his first rodeo and had that stuff protected. I mean, the problem, like he said, is that when people cut corners, right? I mean, they think, hey, I'm going to cut this corner, cut the, that with a hands-on investment like real estate, you can't cut corners. I've listened to a number of their podcasts and I think they're almost probably as good as ours, but so they got a little ways to go. But <laughs> one of the things that I've heard repeatedly is people who excel at this do the same thing over and over again. They buy the same type of house in the same type of neighborhood, the same floor plan. They fill it with the same carpet, the same paint, the same furniture or fixtures. It becomes a machine. That's their shtick. They don't go do that and then go, oh, look, an apartment building. You know, they follow the same model, the same process that once they refine it, that's their factory. That's their operation. So we get letters to the show. These letters this week come from Facebook, letters to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash I stack Benjamins. First one comes from Ashley. Ashley's a new listener. Welcome, Ashley, to the basement. So she's brand new to our podcast and she has a question about something we've talked about in the past. She went to a past episode. That's how she found us, OG. We mentioned that rather than paying extra on a mortgage, taking that extra money and investing it in, she thinks we talked about a mutual fund whose purpose was to eventually pay off your home. That's what she took away from the conversation, at least, she says. So her question is this, does it still make sense to do that if you're underwater on your mortgage? They've been making biweekly payments for a year or so, but she's wondering if even though their condo is worth about 40000 less than what they owe, the extra payment approach is worth it versus the mutual fund approach. What are our thoughts? Thanks for the question, Ashley. Properties underwater, making biweekly payments, and she's wondering if she would be better suited to put that somewhere else. Yes. Is that the general sense of that? Put that well, I, I guess payment. it would all depend on what the plan of the property is. The underwater status of it only matters if you ever plan to sell it, right? I mean, that doesn't affect the loan balance in any way, shape, or form. It affects your equity and it affects your ability to borrow more money against it and all that sort of jazz. But if this is your house that you're going to live in for the next 20 years, eh, I would say that the underwater status matters not in the scheme of paying down the property. If this is a house that you're reluctantly living in because it's underwater and you have to do everything possible to get out of it for one reason or another, then obviously you need to focus on getting yourself to net zero position uh, as quickly as possible. When we moved several years ago, we had a very similar situation. Our house was well underwater and we were kind of stuck for a while. We weren't stuck in a crappy house. We didn't particularly care for the area we lived in after a number of years, but the underwater status of it made it so that we didn't have much choice because it was upside down by hundreds of thousands of dollars. When it got back to even, we moved. In fact, that was the deciding factor. We didn't move because of a job change or that sort of thing. We heard that our neighbor sold his house for the value we thought our, we're like, oh, we're getting on that now. (laughs) It's time to go. I mean, you remember the story. It was like, hey, we found out that what's his name sold his house. We should sell ours too. Let's do it. And then we kind of went to the, oh, no, okay, now that we're selling it, where should we live? But that's because we want to get out of there quick. So I would say if you're going to live there for a long time, this is your house you're going to live in. The status of the value of the property matters very little in the relationship to the loan. And I would consider 
directing those investments elsewhere just because it gives you more flexibility. Yeah. Right now you're filling in the hole, so to speak, by doing the biweekly payments. You're trying to get to zero on that piece of your net worth when instead you could be building an investment account or a savings account or whatever you want to call it outside of that to be used to for any purpose. Right now you're kind of directing all of your extra cash into getting your house value back to zero. That's Here's a part of this discussion that's ugly that people don't like to talk about. You get your house to one payment away from paid off, right? You're making your biweekly payments, get it to one payment away from paid off and you don't pay that last payment. Say it's a $800 payment. Do they just take the last $800 of your house and take it away from you or do they do something different? Yeah. You're obviously using a pretty healthy extreme of that example, but yeah, it would take the whole thing. Sure. So when you talk about being flexible with your money, though, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Now, I have had people take that thing that I just said and say, well, I'm not going to pay extra on my mortgage because they're going to just take away my house if something bad happens to me. You got to put the money somewhere. If you don't invest in yourself, nobody's going to do it for you. So don't use that as an excuse to do nothing. Putting it on your house is a great option. And like you said, depends on your time frame, right? If you're only there short term, Who knows if the stock market is going to beat your mortgage over the short term? We don't know. But over really long periods of time? About 3%. I mean, the real estate market increases about the rate of inflation. Yeah. pretty standard. So. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking about the rate on the loan, though. Yeah. Okay. You know, beating the rate on the loan. Yeah. All of those are considerations. I see what you're saying. You know, do you have two loans and one of them's a HELOC at 11.5%? Well, yeah, we want to aggressively pay that down. Right. Directly to the HELOC. Yeah. Yeah. To the HELOC. I mean, is it a 3.5% 30-year fixed mortgage that you happen to be underwater on? I mean, I'd let that baby ride. (laughs) Our next question comes to us from Jason. Jason, longtime listener, actually wrote us a question about he had Fidelity actually managing his money and at a quarterly advisement fee, want to move the money out of there. That was back in October. We addressed that question in November, but he has a new question. He had mentioned during his letter that he worked for Bluebell, Bluebell, the popular ice cream brand, regional ice cream brand that had some big problems. If you remember, OG, they took that off the shelf in a lot of places. He just wrote and said, remember me, the guy that quit working for Bluebell after many years, you knew this was a to be continued, dun, dun, dun. That's what I wrote to him. I said, there's going to be more that comes out about this. He said, the CEO is under criminal investigation, time to yank his employee stock ownership program and invest to impress, or does he let it sit for a potential resurrection? And then he says, hey, get out of the basement, man. It's 2016. Not that there's anything wrong with the basement, but don't you remember the Jefferson's theme song, you know, move it on up to the top Mm -hmm. of Deluxe Apartment? Well, you know, we tried. We're moving on up. Moving on up. To the east side. To the east side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's time we got a piece of the pie, OG. I think that's how that ends. (laughs) Right. But it's very comfortable down here in mom's basement. And the rent price is perfect. Going back to what price is about correct. Yeah. What Brandon talked about. But anyway, so you've got Bluebell CEO, according to Jason, that is under criminal investigation, employee stock plan. Does he let it sit or does he move it? So this is a tough predicament here. Well, half the reason it's tough, OG, is he's asking us to predict the future. Yeah. And you just can't. Yeah. Let me give you as best a non-answer as I can from my side of the table here. I don't think you ever want to have more than 5% of your investment portfolio tied up in your company stock. The company you work for, you mean? The company you work for. Or any company for that matter. Well, right. It's just too much risk, single issue risk there. So, you know, if you happen to work for a company, he mentions Bluebell, but if you happen to work for any company and they've got an employee stock purchase plan or... There's some companies that match into your 401k using company stock, or you have the option of contributing into company stock or whatever. I'm not a big fan of anything more than 5%. That's just, you're tying up your employment, you're tying up your retirement account, your livelihood, all of that based on the decisions of a handful of corporate executives. He says that in this case, the CEO's got some issues going on. That's a really tough thing to say. You know, he says that in his company, the CEO's facing some troubles here. Does that mean that the entire company's going under, you know, we don't have a crystal ball on that. And anything that you do, I would say would fall under you trying to market time. Yeah. If you try to get the money out and betting on the crash and then going, well, I can put it back in. Or, you know, if your plan allows that sort of stuff, you're trying to do market timing. If you are going to let it sit because you think it's going to rebound, you know, that's market timing. It's just a different variation of that. What do you think about this? 
what if Jason starts off with his goal? And if this is money he needs to achieve his goal, don't play the game. Diversify that money. Make sure that it achieves the goal because you don't want to sit back and go, I didn't achieve my goal because I bet on something I bet wrong. But if it's money over and above money he needs to achieve the goal, then, you know, around your 5% rule, then decide whether you play the game or not. Well, I think even if it does or doesn't achieve the goal, I think the overriding thing is diversification, rebalancing on a predictable time and invest money and, you know, don't monkey with it. So if your investment plan has this company, you know, you said it's Bluebell. I don't know enough about the company. I think it's private. I don't think it's a publicly traded company, which means that they're probably a pretty small company. So this would be like your small cap holding of your investment account. You know, if this is a really small company and that's, there's risk that goes in with investing in a really, really, really small company. So if you don't think that you're going to get paid the return for the risk associated with that really, really small company, if that doesn't suit your risk profile, I wouldn't have any money there, regardless of what the CEO is doing or not doing. Right, right. Great question, Jason. If you've got questions for the show, send those to me, Joe, at stackingbenjamins.com. You go to the head of the class if you leave us a voicemail. We've had some awesome voicemails at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Hey, you want to make 2016 epic? Our business partner, Kathleen, back a few years ago now, she was making $33,000 a year, woke up with a ton of credit card debt and said, you know what? I got to do things differently. She learned how to live on, get this, 50% of her income. She saved 50% of her income. Now she's teaching you how to do the same. Head to save50.org if you want to make 2016 epic. Join her class and details are at save50.org. Funny OG, because when we look at lessons, of course, Brandon Turner, thanks to Brandon again from Bigger Pockets, some great lessons today on real estate. But besides the lessons on real estate, you know, Chuck Jaffe in his article talked about uh, greed and really Jason's question about Bluebell is kind of also a little question about greed, right? I mean, do I get greedy and I take what might end up being something really great? Or do I take the chips that I have right now based on what I know today and move those back into my wallet? And there's nothing wrong with swinging for the fences with some of your investment portfolio, but you have to know the risk return kind of profile with that. And I don't think that you do any swinging for the fences money until you know all your other goals are taken care of. There was a little game that great advisor taught me. He would play with his clients in this case. If they didn't know what to do, he would take out a coin And he'd say, okay, heads, we take the money out, tails, we leave it in. And he'd flip the coin and he'd immediately hide it. And he would ask his clients which one they hoped it was. And then he would just put the coin away after that. And they'd say, well, what was it? He goes, nope. If you couldn't make up your mind, that coin in the air where you're going to take the result, like nine times out of 10, he said the client that couldn't figure out which way to go, he would flip the coin and then he'd realize which way they really wanted to go. Interesting. And then there was another game that he would play which was which feeling is stronger? You leave the money in the company and it all goes away or you take the money out that you have now and it goes through the roof. Which one makes you feel worse? Because that's one you probably want to avoid. And it was funny because every single person, I started using that sometime with clients and every single person would say, well, that's obvious. If I don't let it ride and I would have made a lot of money, I'd feel horrible that I missed out on that. And our people would say, are you kidding me? I'd feel horrible if it went to nothing. Yeah. But everybody said, well, it's obvious. And what's funny well, it's is, obvious. yeah, from my side of the table, it was never obvious. Right. You know, not as obvious as between 8 and 40% of Americans don't follow any resolutions, OG. I don't want to talk about that anymore. That is way obvious to me. And it's also incredibly obvious to me that from now on, you and I are going to dinner and we randomly split the bill. Ah, yes. You reminded me. I've got a funny story about that. A different game. (laughs) Some other day, right? All right, everybody. We'll see you back here on Friday where we've got the original roundtable team, Len Penzo from LenPenzo.com, Paula Pant from Afford Anything, Greg McFarlane from Control Your Cash and Investopedia. And we've got a potpourri of topics coming for you on Friday. We'll see everybody stacking more Benjamins. 
This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC, copyright 2016. It's created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Brent Selmans, and edited by Isabella Bianca. Special thanks to Brandon Turner for giving us great ideas on real estate investing. You can check out his work at www.biggerpockets.com. And thanks to Joe's mom for agreeing to lease her utility closet so I can sublet it out to people who want to move into the neighborhood. Remember, if you're looking to move into Joe's mom's area, I'm pretty much the real estate kingpin in the greater Joe's mom's basement region. See you on Friday for more Stacking Benjamins. The part of Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, has been nominated for an Oscar. Welcome to the After Show, the part of the show that doesn't exist. And I will apologize up front, OG, because you and I were going to tell a story about another way that people decide to share. Let's just put it that way. But it turned out that story was way, way, way R-rated. So unfortunately, we have to move that to the green room. And there's another reason for that. Apple has decided that you have to label your podcast explicit or clean. And so we beep out everything. And even in the after show, we got to keep it uh, somewhat clean. But I do have to say that was a creative, very creative way to uh, split things when you're at a conference or a hotel. Yes. I've never tried it myself, but if anybody has, I'm send not me sure. the story, anonymous. <laughs> on, they don't um, even know what we're talking about because we're not going to release it till tomorrow in the green room. But yeah. yeah, but if you have, we'd love to hear that story. Make it as uh, titillizing as possible. It'll play out like one of those, I can't believe something like this happened to me. (laughs) I just was trying to get a pizza. These stories never happened to me. Things like this never happened to me. I was just trying to get a pizza delivered when, yeah. Hey, I went and saw a movie that has been much lauded and is one of the choices. uh, Well, we'll see when the Academy Award nominations come out, whether this will be up for an Academy Award. But I went and saw this movie last week. This is called Spider. Spotlight. I know there's things you cannot tell me, but I also know there's a story here, and I think everybody will hear about it. Do you think your paper has the resources to take that on? I do. Do you? The Boston priest molested kids in six different parishes over the last 30 years. The church found out about it and did nothing. We haven't committed any long-term investigative resources to the case. No, we haven't. And that's the kind of thing your team would do. Spotlight. Guys, listen. Everybody's going to be interested in this. Oh, it turns out everybody was interested in this. I don't know if you remember this, OG, but the story about... They come up with a story about there might be a priest or two or maybe three that might have taken advantage of children. And so it's a very creepy topic. And the, which broke after that, the Boston Globe, this group, this spotlight group, it broke the story. This is the true story of that happening. A lot of people have already commented that this is the type of story that can immediately go south. I know friends of ours were going to go see it with us when we said, hey, we're going to see a movie. And then they looked up what the movie was and they went, oh, God, no, I don't want to see that because of the fact that the That's basically what I said. Because the subject matter is so revolting about what was happening. But what's fantastic about this movie is a lot like The Martian, and the reason why I think it's on so many people's list of potential Academy Award nominated movies, is that it's a very workmanlike movie. It's about them uncovering the stuff. You know what I mean? It doesn't dwell on what happened. I mean, don't get me wrong. They talk about what happened, but it dwells on the investigation and how they uncover stuff. Like in The Martian, you know, piece by piece, he figures out a way to potentially stay alive in The Martian. In this one, they start off with this Catholic church that's blocking them, blocking them. And then little by little, they uncover more they uncover more. And then they uncover so much more that they can't believe they're even uncovering it. And then it's, it's how do we do this in a responsible 
journalistic way. That was something I took out of this movie. I mean, we led today off with the dumbest thing I've read on the internet. There's so much garbage out there that people are printing in places, even like courts. I mean, that article we had at the beginning of the show, it's just, things are so dumbed down and I'm so tired of Facebook because I get so tired of reading, oh, guess what so-and-so supporters think? So-and-so supporters, you know, talking about politics, which we're going to see more of, right, are so stupid. Look at what they read about, said on this website about this person. I'm like, okay, maybe some of, some of so-and-so supporters are stupid, but this article is so unbelievably slanted, like responsible journalism. We don't fact check. We don't think about what we're going to put out there. It's just, let's put it out there quicker. Let's make it greasier. Let's make it meaner because guess what that sells? This is the Boston Globe back in the day, man, going through layers and layers of should we print this? Is this something we really should be having our pages? Is this responsible? That part of the movie also was kind of a takeaway that in some ways, man, I miss those days, really miss those days. But the public has voted, right? We voted. We want slanted news. And I'm not going to watch news that's slanted the other way. I want news that's slanted my way because the people on the other side, if I demonize those people enough, well, then clearly they're idiots and I'm smart drives me crazy. I thought this was a phenomenal movie and I can definitely see why. Here's what's frustrating for me. Michael Keaton's in this movie. Rachel McAdams is in this movie. Stanley Tucci, who a lot of people don't know that name, but when you see him, you're like, oh God, he's in everything, right? Stanley Tucci's in the movie. The guy from, I don't even know this guy's name, the dude with white hair who's in uh, Mad Men. He's in all kinds of stuff. The really white haired dude. He's in this movie. They're just, you keep seeing people in this, there are so many big names in this movie. Didn't come to Texarkana. Movie hasn't come to my Cinemark movie theater, which was the same thing that happened with King's Speech, right? A King's Speech, which is a fantastic movie. I think we can all agree on that. Didn't come here until after it won the Academy Award. Finally, they're like, oh, maybe those people in those little towns might want to see this movie. So I got to drive 75 miles to Shreveport to go see this movie. Now that's my choice. They casinos in Shreveport? They do. Yeah. What are the tables like? I haven't been inside the casinos. Could you do that next time? See if they have a, a table tax. Just for you. I did go to horse racing in uh, Shreveport. And they, Dude, it was so fun. I won 180 bucks. Nice. How much did you bet? 250 I bet two $5 bets. You got 180 I take that back. I won on, uh, I take that back. There were $2 bets. I'm picking the ponies. But I spent a total of $10 betting and I won on two of the five bets that I made. But anyway, so that was a lot of fun. But inside of the horse racing casino, because there's a casino outside of there, no tables at all. Just all machines. But I'm not sure about the big ones down by the river. The horseshoe and... Take me to the river. Yeah, there was that one. There's Sam's Place, the horseshoe, and Margaritaville casinos. Uh, I like margaritas. uh, uh, mm, Sounds good. Anyway, Spotlight, big thumbs up. Business partner Kathleen said she likes Spotlight better than Brooklyn. I still think Brooklyn is my number one movie of the year so far. That's right. You have a screwy year. Yeah, I go Academy Awards to Academy Awards. So uh, still my favorite movie. I go, you know, based on the release date, right? Like a movie I watch in January that's released in January, which means it's a crappy movie. Uh, Generally, those movies count as the next year. But if they're up for Academy Awards and they were released last year, like Revenant, I haven't seen. What can't wait to see that thing. You know, where they're up. up. Hateful Eight. You know, Hateful Eight, I really don't want to see because I had several friends that I trust that went to see it and didn't love it. Like they liked it. So I think I'll wait for Hateful Eight on video. But great movie, not my favorite movie. Still, my number one is Brooklyn. My number two is still Ex Machina. This might be number three. Fantastic film. Anyway, that's that, man. Okay. Hey, did you see Star Wars? Twice. Did you? Oh, we got to mm-hmm. talk about that then next time. Okay. I have a young son who wanted to see it, but since they rated it PG-13, I had to check it out first. So I went late one night to see the movie. And then I, when I woke up in the morning, my son was like, so is it okay for me to go? Can I go? Can I go? Can I go? And I said, yeah, we're going to go. So I, and we just went that morning. Like, so I went at night, came home, went to bed, got up in the morning, ate breakfast and went again. It's ever bit as much fun the second time, isn't it? Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, not to give yeah. away our review of the movie, but. And I saw, and I also watched The Martian. Oh, twice. Yeah. So I watched it. It was on Apple TV. So I watched it, you know, by myself. And then we were kind of at the end of Christmas break, just kind of like, oh, and the kids are just playing video games. We got to like detox them somehow. And I told my wife, I said, we can watch The Martian. She goes, well, it's PG-13. I said, yeah, that's really, yeah. it's I, not, it's a, you know, there's the one scene where he gets like stabbed with the spiky thing and he's got to like, I like the fact himself that, up. I like the fact that he's being resourceful. Well, that's why I thought that the kids would like it was because, you know, it was kind of like a solo endeavor 
and it was against all odds and he had to like farm and he had to engineer stuff and he had to use math and science and all that sort of stuff. That's kind of what I was hoping they got out of it. And they, and they did. My youngest kind of got bored. In fact, he wrote a sticky note. He was like coloring and he had a sticky. I'll show it to you. It's really funny. It's a sticky note and it says day 461. There are too many days. <laughs> so he was bored. Like he was, he got about two thirds of the way through and he was like, good. And then he watched the ending. And then my other son, who's a little bit older, who got about a third of the way into it, and he goes, Dad, that's a pretty cool movie. Because he didn't want to watch it. He right. was like, I want to play Xbox. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, even that movie is good enough for, you know. Yeah. So, there's your review of The Martian right there, then. <laughs> I'm assuming then that's a big thumbs up. I liked it. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't yeah. any earth shattering. It was a good popcorn movie. You no, know, but you know what? Of- it is just like Star Wars, where it just delivers on what you expect. Yes. Fantastic stuff. Love The Martian. Thought that was great. That'll end the year, my top 10. Uh, by the way, I am not at all amazed that Mad Max Fury Road is on all these lists. I think I said that last week, too. Just Mad Max was so good. You still haven't seen it? No, never will. Oh. Just me. Sci-fi, I don't... I but it's not really... Uh, like people in weird masks, racing, shooting each other with flame guns and stuff. Eh, I gotta tell I haven't seen a better action movie. I watch can't. Apocalypse Now. That's a better action movie. Apocalypse Now is not an action movie, dude. There is so little action in Apocalypse Now. That was what I expected. That's what I expected when I watched Apocalypse Now was a bunch of action. That movie is not an yeah, action movie. more of a thinking movie. How about Full Metal Jacket? Full Metal Jacket is an action movie. There's yeah. some action in that. Yeah, that's true. How do you shoot women and children? It's easy. <laughs> you don't lead them as much. <laughs> Get some. <laughs> I told you when I was at the... <laughs> When I was at the Citadel, we got in trouble because our platoon leader led a chant as we were headed marching to the football game that was not appropriate. And at the time, I thought it was kind of like that, but no, I don't think I will. I think I'm going to Great leave. story. Great story, Joe. Thanks for sharing. There's this one thing I did that was like kind of controversial. It's it kind of funny story, but anyway, I'm not going to tell you anybody about it. So go to hell. See ya. So we were all just, you know, I was a freshman. So you just say what you're told to say. So we are marching down the road and, oh my, our whole company got in such bad trouble. 